I have a few pictures uh, of what I do, and I'll speak about some of them, and then I'll let them continue to scroll as I talk a little bit about how I'm able to do what I do. And uh, the, uh, uh, this first house, all these houses uh, are built from uh, between 70 and 80 percent recycled materials, stuff that was headed to the mulcher, the landfill, the burn pile. It was all just gone. This is the first house I built. Uh, these are hickory nuts up there. Uh, this double front door here with the uh, three light transom that was headed to the landfill. Uh, have a little turret there. And then uh, these uh, buttons that on the corbels here, uh, you'll see uh, uh, right there, those are hickory nuts. And these, uh, these buttons there, those are chicken eggs. And uh, <laughs> of course, first you have breakfast. And then you, uh, you, you fill the shelf full of Bondo and paint it and nail it up. And uh, you have an architectural button in just a fraction of the time. Um, then this is a, a look at, at the inside. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the three light transom there with the uh, eyebrow windows, certainly an architectural antique, um, headed to the landfill. Even the lock, lock set is probably worth $200. $200. Uh, everything in the kitchen was salvaged. There's a 1952 O'Keefe Merritt stove, if you like to cook, cool stove. Uh, this is going up into the turret. I got that staircase uh, for $20, including delivery to my lot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then, uh, looking up in the turret, you see there are bulges and pokes and sags and so forth. Well, if that ruins your life, well, then you shouldn't live there. Uh, uh, this is uh, a laundry chute, and this right here is a shoe last, and those are those ca cast iron things you see at antique shops. So I had one of those, so I made some low-tech gadgetry there uh, that, uh, where you just stomp on the shoe last, and then the door flies open, you throw your laundry down. And then uh, if you're smart enough, it goes into a basket on top of the washer. If not, it goes, goes into the toilet. <laughs> uh, this is a bathtub I made. I uh, made out of scrap uh, two by four here, started with a rim there, and then uh, glued and nailed it up into a flat, corbelled it up and flipped it over, and then did, did the two profiles on this side. It's a two-person tub. Uh, after all, uh, it's not just a question of hygiene, but there's a possibility of, of recreation as well. <laughs> Uh, then this, uh, this faucet here is uh, just a piece of uh, Osage orange. It, uh, it looks a little phallic, but after all, it's a bathroom. Uh, uh, then this is a house based on a Budweiser can. It doesn't look like a can of beer, but uh, the design takeoffs are absolutely unmistakable. The barley hops design worked up into the eaves. Then the dental work comes directly off the can. It's red, white, blue, and silver. Uh, then these uh, corbels going down underneath the eaves are that little design that comes off the can. I just put a can on a copier and kept enlarging it until I got the size I want. Uh, then uh, on, the, on the can it says, this is the famous Budweiser beer we know of, no other beer, blah, 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 blah. So we changed that and put, this is the famous Budweiser house. We don't know of any other house and so forth and so on. Uh, then there's a deadbolt. It's a, it's a fence from a 1930 Shaper, which is a very angry woodworking machine. And uh, they gave me the fence, but they didn't give me the Shaper, so we made a deadbolt out of it. And it's, uh, uh, that'll keep bull elephants out, I promise. <laughs> and, and sure enough, we've had no, no problems with bull elephants. Uh, the shower is intended to simulate a glass of beer. We've got bubbles going up there and then suds at the top with lumpy tiles. Where do you get lumpy tiles? Well, of course you don't. But I get a lot of toilets, and so you just dispatch a toilet with a hammer, and then you have lumpy tiles. Uh, and then uh, uh, the faucet there is uh, a beer tap. Uh, then uh, this uh, panel of glass is the same panel of glass that occurs in every middle-class front door in America. We're getting tired of it. It's kind of cliched now. So if you put it in the front door, your design fails. So don't put it in the front door. Put it somewhere else. It's a pretty, pretty panel of glass. But then if you put it in the front door, people say, oh, you're trying to be like those guys and you didn't make it. So don't put it there. Um, then uh, another bathroom upstairs, this light up here is the same light that occurs in every middle class foyer in America. Don't put it in the foyer. Put it in the shower or in the closet, but not in the foyer. Um, then somebody gave me a bidet, so it got a bidet. Uh, this little house here, uh, those branches there are made out of uh, Bois Arc or Osage Orange. And these uh, pictures will keep scrolling as I talk a little bit. In order to do 
what I do, you have to understand what causes waste in the building industry. Our housing has become a commodity, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but the first cause of waste is probably even buried in our DNA, in that human beings have a need for maintaining consistency of the apperceptive mass. <laughs> what does that mean? What it means is for every perception we have, it needs to tally with the one like it before, or we don't have continuity and we become a little bit disoriented. So I can show you an object you've never seen before. Oh, that's a cell phone. But you've never seen this one before. What you're doing is sizing up the, uh, the, the pattern of structural features here, and uh, then you go through your data banks, cell phone, oh, that's a cell phone. But if I took a bite out of it, you go, wait a second. <laughs> That's not a cell phone. That's, that's one of those new uh, chocolate cell phones. <laughs> and you'd have to start a new category right between cell phones and chocolate. <laughs> that's, that's how we process information. So you translate that to the building industry. If we have a wall of window panes and one pane is cracked, we go, oh dear. That's cracked. Let's repair it. Let's take it out, throw it away so nobody can use it, and put a new one in because that's what you do with a cracked pane. Never mind that it doesn't affect our lives at all. It only rattles that expected pattern and unity of structural features. However, if we took a small hammer and we added cracks to all the other windows, <laughs> then we have a pattern. Because Gestalt psychology emphasizes the recognition of pattern over parts that comprise a pattern. We'll go, oh, that's nice. So, uh, that serves me every day. Repetition creates pattern. If I have 100 of these, 100 of those, it doesn't make any difference what these and those are. If I can repeat anything, I have the possibility of a pattern. From hickory nuts and chicken eggs, shards of glass, branch, it doesn't make any difference. That causes a lot of waste in the building industry. The second is Friedrich Nietzsche, along about 1885, wrote a book titled The Birth of Tragedy. And in there, he said that cultures tend to swing between one of two perspectives. On the one hand, we have an Apollonian perspective, which is very crisp and premeditated and intellectualized and perfect. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a Dionysian perspective, which is more given to the passions and intuition, tolerant of organic texture and human gesture. So the way the Apollonian personality takes a picture, or hangs a picture, is they'll get out a transit and a laser level and a micrometer. Okay, honey, a thousandth of an inch to the left, that's where we want the picture. Right, perfect. Predicated on plumb level, square, and centered. The Dionysian personality takes the picture and goes... <laughs> that's the difference. I feature blemish. I feature organic process. Dead center John Dewey. Uh, Apollonian mindset creates mountains of waste. If something isn't perfect, if it doesn't line up with that premeditated model, dumpster, oop, scratch, dumpster, oop, this, oop, that, landfill, landfill, landfill. The third thing is arguably the Industrial Revolution started in the Renaissance with the rise of humanism and got a little jump start along about the French Revolution. By the middle of the 19th century, it's in full flower. And we have dumaflages and gizmos and contraptions that will do anything that we, up to that point, had to do by hand. So now we have standardized materials. Well, trees don't grow two inches by four inches, eight, 10, and 12 feet tall. <laughs> we create mountains of waste. And they're doing a pretty good job there in the forest, working uh, all the byproduct of their industry with OSB and particle board and so forth and so on. But it does no good to be responsible at the point of harvest in the forest if consumers are wasting the harvest at the point of consumption. And that's what's happening. And so if something isn't standard, oops, dumpster, oop, this, oop, warp, no. Nope. If you buy a two by four and it's not straight, you can take it back. Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. We'll get you a straight one. Well, I feature all those warped things because repetition creates pattern and it's from the Dionysian perspective. The fourth thing is labor is disproportionately more expensive than materials. Well, that's just a myth. And here's a story. Jim Tullis, one of the guys I trained, I said, Jim, it's time now. I got a job for you as a foreman on a framing crew. It's time for you to go, Dan, I just don't think I'm ready. Uh, Jim, uh, it's time you, but Dan, oh. Uh. So he hired on. And he was out there with his tape measure, going through the trash heap, looking for header material, which is the board that goes over a door. I think he'd impress his boss. That's how I taught him to do it. And the superintendent walked up and said, what are you doing? Oh, just looking for some header material. 
waiting for that, that kudo. He said, no, no, I'm not paying you to go through the trash. Get back to work. And he had the wherewithal to say. He said, you know, if you were paying me $300 an hour, I can see how you might say that. But right now, I'm saving you $5 a minute. Do the math. <laughs> good call, Tullus. From now on, you guys hit this paw first. And the irony is I wasn't very good at math. But... <laughs> Once in a while, you get access to the control room, and then you can kind of mess with the dials, and that's what happened there. <laughs> the fifth thing is that maybe after 2,500 years, Plato is still having his way with us in his notion of perfect forms. He said that we have on our noggin the perfect idea of what we want, and we force environmental resources to accommodate that. So we have, all have on our head the perfect house, the American dream, which is a house, the dream house. The problem is we can't afford it, so we have the American dream look-alike, which is a mobile home. Now there's a blight on the planet. <laughs> it's a chattel mortgage, uh, just like furniture, just like a car. You write the check and instantly it depreciates 30%. After a year, you can't get insurance on everything you have in it, only on 70%. Wired with 14 gauge wire typically, nothing wrong with that, unless you ask it to do what 12 gauge wire is supposed to do, and that's what happens. It outgasses formaldehyde so much so that there is a federal law in place to warn new mobile home buyers the formaldehyde atmosphere danger. Are we being just numbingly stupid? The walls are this thick. The whole thing has the structural value of corn. <laughs> so I thought Palm Harbor Village was over there. No, no, we had a wind last night. It's gone now. <laughs> then when they degrade, what do you do with them? Now, all that, that Apollonian Platonic model is what the building industry is predicated on and there are a number of things that exacerbate that. One is that all the professionals, all the tradesmen, vendors, uh, inspectors, engineers, architects, all think like this. And then it works its way back to the consumer who demands the same model. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We can't get out of it. Then here come the marketeers and the advertisers. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, uh, we buy stuff we didn't know we needed. All we have to do is look at what one company did with carbonated prune juice. How disgusting. <laughs> but you know what they did? They hooked a metaphor into it and said, I drink Dr. Pepper. And pretty soon, we're swilling that stuff by the lake full, by the billions of gallons. It doesn't even have real prunes. It doesn't even keep you regular. My, oh my, that makes it worse, and we get sucked into that faster than anything. Then a man named Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a book titled Being and Nothingness. It's a pretty quick read. You can snap through it in maybe, <laughs> maybe two years if you read eight hours a day. In there, he talked about the divided self. He said, human beings act differently when they know they're alone than when they know somebody else is around. So if I'm eating spaghetti and I know I'm alone, I can eat like a backhoe. I can, I can wipe my mouth on my sleeve, a napkin on the table, chew with my mouth open, make little noises, scratch wherever I want. But as soon as you walk in, I go, ooh, little spaghetti sauce there, napkin in the lap, half bites, chew with my mouth closed, no scratching. Now, what I'm doing is fulfilling your expectations of how I should live my life. I feel that expectation, and so I accommodate it, and I'm living my life according to what you expect me to do. That happens in the building industry as well. That's why all of our subdivisions look the same. Sometimes we even have these, these formalized uh, cultural expectations. I'll bet all your shoes match. Sure enough, we all buy into that. <laughs> and with, with gated communities, we have a formalized expectation with a homeowners association. Sometimes those guys are Nazis. My, oh my. That exacerbates and continues this model. The last thing is gregariousness. Human beings are a social species. We like to hang together in groups. And just like wildebeests, just like lions. Wildebeests don't hang with lions because lions eat wildebeests. Human beings are like that. We do what that group does that we're trying to identify with. And so you see this in junior high a lot. Those kids, they'll work all summer long, kill themselves, so that they can afford one pair of designer jeans. So along about September, they can stride in and go, I'm important. 
today. See, whoop, don't touch my designer jeans. I see you don't have designer jeans. You, you don't, you're not one of the beautiful, see, I'm one of the beautiful people. See my jeans? Right there is reason enough to have uniforms. And so that happens in the building industry as well. We have confused Maslow's hierarchy of needs just a little bit. On the bottom tier, we have basic needs. Shelter, clothing, food, water, uh, mating, so forth. Second, security. Third, relationships. Fourth, status, self-esteem. That is vanity. And we're taking vanity and shoving it down here. And so we end up with vain decisions and we can't even afford our mortgage. We can't afford to eat anything except beans. That is, our housing has become a commodity. And it takes a little bit of nerve to dive into those primal, terrifying parts of ourselves and make our own decisions and not make our housing a commodity, but make it something that bubbles up from seminal sources. That takes a little bit of nerve. And darn it, once in a while you fail. But that's okay. If, you, if failure destroys you, then you can't do this. I fail all the time, every day. And I've had some whopping failures, I promise, where big, public, humiliating, embarrassing failures. Everybody points and laughs and he says, he tried it a fifth time and it still didn't work, what a moron. Early on, contractors come by and say, Dan, you're a cute little bunny, but you know, this just isn't gonna work. Why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And your instinct is to say, well, why don't you suck an egg? <laughs> but you don't say that because they're the guys you're targeting. And so, what we've done, and this isn't just in housing, it's clothing, in food, in our transportation needs, our energy, we sprawl just a little bit. And when I get a little bit of uh, press, I hear from people all over the world. And we may have invented excess, but the problem of waste is worldwide. We are ha we, we're in trouble. And I don't wear ammo belts crisscrossing my chest and a red bandana, but we're clearly in trouble. And what we need to do is reconnect with those really primal parts of ourselves and make some decisions and say, you know, I think I would like to put CDs across the wall there. What do you think, honey? If it doesn't work, take it down. What we need to do is reconnect with who we really are. And that's thrilling indeed. Thank you very much.